Part Two of The Eyes Have It by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eyes Have It, Part Two. My lady said, Sir Pierre gently, the Duke's investigators have arrived. My Lady Alice, Countess de Vreux, was seated in a gold brocade upholstered chair in the small receiving room off the great hall. Standing near her, looking very grave, was Father Bright. Against the blaze of color on the walls of the room, the two of them stood out like ink blots. Father Bright wore his normal clerical black, unrelieved except for the pure white lace at collar and cuffs. The Countess wore unadorned black velvet a dress which she had had to have altered hurriedly by her dressmaker. She had always hated black, and owned only the mourning she had worn when her mother died eight years before. The somber looks on their faces seemed to make the black blacker. "'Show them in, Sir Pierre,' the Countess said calmly. Sir Pierre opened the door wider, and three men entered. One was dressed as one gently born, the other two wore the livery of the Duke of Normandy. The gentleman bowed. "'I am Lord Darcy, chief criminal investigator for His Highness the Duke, and your servant, my lady.' He was a tall, brown-haired man in his thirties, with a rather handsome, lean face. He spoke Anglo-French with a definite English accent. "'My pleasure, Lord Darcy,' said the Countess. "'This is our vicar, Father Bright.' "'Your servant, Reverend Sir.' Then he presented the two men with him. The first was a scholarly-looking, graying man wearing pince-nez glasses with gold rims, Dr. Pateley, physician. The second, a tubby, red-faced, smiling man, was Master Sean O'Loughlin, sorcerer. As soon as Master Sean was presented, he removed a small, leather-bound folder from his belt-pouch and proffered it to the priest. "'My license, Reverend Father.' Father Bright took it and glanced over it. It was the usual thing, signed and sealed by the Archbishop of Rouen. The law was rather strict on that point. No sorcerer could practice without the permission of the Church, and a license was given only after careful examination for orthodoxy of practice. "'It seems to be quite in order, Master Sean,' said the priest, handing the folder back. The tubby little sorcerer bowed his thanks and returned the folder to his belt-pouch. Lord Darcy had a notebook in his hand. "'Now, unpleasant as it may be, we shall have to check on a few facts.' He consulted his notes, then looked up at Sir Pierre. "'You, I believe, discovered the body?' "'That is correct, your lordship. How long ago was this?' Sir Pierre glanced at his wrist-watch. It was nine-fifty-five. Not quite three hours ago, your lordship. At what time precisely? I rapped on the door precisely at seven, and went in a minute or two later, say, 7.01 or 7.02. How do you know the time so exactly? My lord the Count, said Sir Pierre with some stiffness, insisted upon exact punctuality. I have formed the habit of referring to my watch regularly. I see. Very good. Now, what did you do then?" Sir Pierre described his actions briefly. "'The door to his suite was not locked then?' Lord Darcy asked. "'No, sir.' "'You did not expect it to be locked?' "'No, sir. It has not been for seventeen years.' Lord Darcy raised one eyebrow in a polite query. "'Never? Not at seven o'clock, your lordship.' My lord the Count always rose promptly at six and unlocked the door before seven. He did lock it at night, then? Yes, sir. Lord Darcy looked thoughtful and made a note, but he said nothing more on that subject. When you left, you locked the door? That is correct, your lordship. And it has remained locked ever since? Sir Pierre hesitated and glanced at Father Bright. The priest said, at eight-fifteen, Sir Pierre and I went in. I wished to view the body. We touched nothing. We left at eight-twenty. Master Sean O'Loughlin looked agitated. "'Er, excuse me, Reverend Sir, 
You didn't give him holy unction, I hope. No, said Father Bright. I thought it would be better to delay that until after the authorities had seen the, er, scene of the crime. I wouldn't want to make the gathering of evidence any more difficult than necessary. Quite right, murmured Lord Darcy. No blessings, I trust, reverend sir? Master Sean persisted. No exorcisms are nothing, Father Bright interrupted somewhat testily. I believe I crossed myself when I saw the body, but nothing more. Crossed yourself, sir. Nothing else? No. Well, that's all right, then. Sorry to be so persistent, reverend sir, but any miasma of evil that may be left around is a very important clue, and it shouldn't be dispersed until it's been checked, you see. Evil? My lady the countess looked shocked. Sorry, my lady, but— Master Sean began contritely. But Father Bright interrupted by speaking to the countess. Don't distress yourself, my daughter. These men are only doing their duty. Of course, I understand. It's just that it's so. She shuddered delicately. Lord Darcy cast Master Sean a warning look, then asked politely, Has my lady seen the deceased? No, she said. I will, however, if you wish. We'll see, said Lord Darcy. Perhaps it won't be necessary. May we go up to the suite now? Certainly, the Countess said. Sir Pierre, if you will. Yes, my lady. As Sir Pierre unlocked the emblazoned door, Lord Darcy said, Who else sleeps on this floor? No one else, your lordship, Sir Pierre said. The entire floor is, was, reserved for my lord the Count. Is there any way up besides that elevator? Sir Pierre turned and pointed toward the other end of the short hallway. That leads to the staircase he said, pointing to a massive oaken door. But it's kept locked at all times, and, as you can see, there is a heavy bar across it. Except for moving furniture in and out or something like that, it's never used. No other way up or down, then? Sir Pierre hesitated. Well, yes, your lordship, there is. I'll show you. A secret stairway? Yes, your lordship. Very well. We'll look at it after we've seen the body. Lord Darcy, having spent an hour on the train down from Rouen, was anxious to see the cause of the trouble at last. He lay in the bedroom, just as Sir Pierre and Father Bright had left him. "'If you please, Dr. Pateley,' said his lordship. He knelt on one side of the corpse and watched carefully while Pateley knelt on the other side and looked at the face of the dead man. Then he touched one of the hands and tried to move an arm. "'Rigor has set in.' even to the fingers. Single bullet hole. Rather small caliber. I should say a twenty-eight or thirty-four. Hard to tell until I've probed out the bullet. Looks like it went right through the heart, though. Hard to tell about powder burns. The blood has soaked the clothing and dried. Still, these specks. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Lord Darcy's eyes took in everything but there was little enough to see on the body itself. Then his eye was caught by something that gave off a golden gleam. He stood up and walked over to the great canopied four-poster bed. Then he was on his knees again, peering under it. A coin? No. He picked it up carefully and looked at it. A button, gold, intricately engraved in an arabesque pattern, and set in the center with a single diamond. How long had it lain there? Where had it come from? Not from the Count's clothing, for his buttons were smaller, engraved with his arms, and had no gems. Had a man or a woman dropped it? There was no way of knowing at this stage of the game. Darcy turned to Sir Pierre. When was this room last cleaned? Last evening, your lordship, the secretary said promptly. My lord was always particular about that. The suite was always to be swept and cleaned during the dinner hour. Then this must have rolled under the bed at some time after dinner. Do you recognize it? The design is distinctive. The privy secretary looked carefully at the button in the palm of Lord Darcy's hand without touching it. I—I I hesitate to say, he said at last, 
It looks like, but I'm not sure. Come, come, Chevalier, where do you think you might have seen it? Or one like it?" There was a sharpness in the tone of his voice. "'I'm not trying to conceal anything, your lordship,' Sir Pierre said with equal sharpness. "'I said I was not sure. I still am not. But it can be checked easily enough. If your lordship will permit me—' He turned and spoke to Dr. Pateley, who was still kneeling by the body. "'May I have my lord the Count's keys, doctor?' Pateley glanced up at Lord Darcy, who nodded silently. The physician detached the keys from the belt and handed them to Sir Pierre. The privy secretary looked at them for a moment, then selected a small gold key. "'This is it,' he said, separating it from the others on the ring. "'Come with me, your lordship.' Darcy followed him across the room to a broad wall covered with a great tapestry that must have dated back to the sixteenth century. Sir Pierre reached behind it and pulled a cord. The entire tapestry slid aside like a panel, and Lord Darcy saw that it was supported on a track some ten feet from the floor. Behind it was what looked at first like ordinary oak panelling, but Sir Pierre fitted the small key into an inconspicuous hole and turned, or rather tried to turn. "'That's odd,' said Sir Pierre. "'It's not locked.' He took the key out and pressed on the panel, shoving sideways with his hand to move it aside. It slid open to reveal a closet. The closet was filled with women's clothing of all kinds and styles. Lord Darcy whistled soundlessly. "'Try that blue robe, your lordship,' the privy secretary said. "'The one with the—yes, that's the one.' Lord Darcy took it off its hanger. The same buttons. They matched and there was one missing from the front, torn off. "'Master Sean,' he called without turning. Master Sean came with a rolling walk. He was holding an oddly shaped bronze thing in his hands that Sir Pierre didn't quite recognize. The sorcerer was muttering, "'Eva, that there is. Faith, and the vibrations are all over the place. Yes, my lord. Check this dress and the button when you get round to it. I want to know when the two parted company." "'Yes, my lord.' He draped the robe over one arm and dropped the button into a pouch at his belt. "'I can tell you one thing, my lord. You talk about an evil miasma. This room has got it.' He held up the object in his hand. "'There's an underlying background, something that has been here for years, just sipping in. But on top of that there's a hellish big blast of it superimposed. Fresh it is, and very strong." I shouldn't be surprised, considering there was murder done here last night, or very early this morning," said Lord Darcy. Hm. yes, yes, my lord, the death is there. But there's something else, something I can't place." "'You can tell that just by holding that bronze cross in your hand?' Sir Pierre asked interestedly. Master Sean gave him a friendly scowl. "'Tisn't quite a cross, sir. This is what is known as a crux anseta. The ancient Egyptians called it an ankh. Notice the loop at the top instead of the straight piece your true cross has. Now your true cross, if it were properly energized, blessed, you see, your true cross would tend to dissipate the evil. The ankh merely vibrates to evil because of the closed loop at the top, which makes a return circuit. And it's not energized by blessing, but by another, um, spell. "'Master Sean, we have a murder to investigate,' said Lord Darcy. The sorcerer caught the tone of his voice and nodded quickly. "'Yes, my lord,' and he walked rollingly away. "'Now where's that secret stairway you mentioned, Sir Pierre?' Lord Darcy asked. "'This way, your lordship.' He led Lord Darcy to a wall at right angles to the outer wall, and slid back another tapestry. "'Good heavens!' Darcy muttered. Does he have something concealed behind every arras in the place? But he didn't say it loud enough for the privy secretary to hear. This time what greeted them was a solid-seeming stone wall, but Sir Pierre pressed in on one small stone, and a section of the wall swung back, exposing a stairway. "'Oh, yes,' Darcy said. "'I see what he did. This is the old spiral stairway that goes round the inside of the keep.' There are two doorways at the bottom. 
One opens into the courtyard, the other is a postern gate through the curtain wall to the outside. But that was closed up in the sixteenth century, so the only way out is into the courtyard. "'Your lordship knows Castle de Vreau, then?' Sir Pierre said. The knight himself was nearly fifty, while Darcy was only in his thirties, and Sir Pierre had no recollection of Darcy's having been in the castle before. "'Only by means in the royal archives. But I have made it a point to—' He stopped. "'Dear me!' he interrupted himself mildly. "'What is that?' That was something that had been hidden by the heiress until Sir Pierre had slid it aside, and was still showing only a part of itself. It lay on the floor a foot or so from the secret door. Darcy knelt down and pulled the tapestry back from the object. "'Well, well! A twenty-eight caliber two-shot pocket-gun! Gold-chased, beautifully engraved, mother-of-pearl handle! A regular gem!' He picked it up and examined it closely. One shot fired. He stood up and showed it to Sir Pierre. "'Ever seen it before?' The privy secretary looked at the weapon closely. Then he shook his head. "'Not that I recall, your lordship. It certainly isn't one of the Count's guns.' "'You're certain?' "'Quite certain, your lordship. I'll show you the gun collection if you want. My lord the Count didn't like tiny guns like that. He preferred a larger caliber. He would never have owned what he considered a toy. "'Well, we'll have to look into it.' He called over Master Sean again and gave him the gun into his keeping. "'And keep your eyes open for anything else of interest, Master Sean. So far everything of interest besides the late Count himself has been hiding under beds or behind arrases. Check everything. Sir Pierre and I are going for a look down this stairway.' The stairway was gloomy, but enough light came in through the arrow slits spaced at intervals along the outer way to illuminate the interior. It spiraled down between the inner and outer walls of the great keep, making four complete circuits before it reached ground level. Lord Darcy looked carefully at the steps, the walls, and even the low, arched overhead as he and Sir Pierre went down. After the first circuit, on the floor beneath the Count's suite, he stopped. "'There was a door here,' he said, pointing to a rectangular area in the inner wall. "'Yes, your lordship, there used to be an opening at every floor but they were all sealed off. It's quite solid, as you can see. Where would they lead if they were open? The county offices, my own office, the clerk's offices, the constabulary on the first floor. Below are the dungeons. My lord the Count was the only one who lived in the keep itself. The rest of the household live above the great hall. What about guests? They are usually housed in the east wing. We have only two house-guests at the moment. Laird and Lady Duncan have been with us for four days. I see. They went down perhaps four more steps before Lord Darcy asked quietly, "'Tell me, Sir Pierre, were you privy to all of Count de Vreau's business?' Another four steps down before Sir Pierre answered. "'I understand what your lordship means,' he said. Another two steps. No, I was not. I was aware that my lord the Count engaged in certain, er, uh, shall we say, liaisons with members of the opposite sex. However—' He paused, and in the gloom Lord Darcy could see his lips tighten. "'However,' he continued, "'I did not procure for my lord, if that is what you're driving at. I am not, and never have been, a pimp.' "'I didn't intend to suggest that you had, good night,' said Lord Darcy, in a tone that strongly implied that the thought had actually never crossed his mind. "'Not at all. But certainly there is a difference between aiding and abetting and simple knowledge of what is going on.' "'Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, one cannot, of course, be the secretary in private of a gentleman such as my lord the Count for seventeen years without knowing something of what is going on, you're right. Yes, yes. Hmm. Lord Darcy smiled to himself. Not until this moment had Sir Pierre realized how much he actually did know. In loyalty to his lord, he had literally kept his eyes shut for seventeen years. I realize, Lord Darcy said smoothly, 
that a gentleman would never implicate a lady nor besmirch the reputation of another gentleman without due cause and careful consideration. However, like the knight, he paused a moment before going on. Although we are aware that he was not discreet, was he particular? If you mean by that, did he confine his attentions to those of gentle birth, your lordship, then I can say, no, he did not. If you mean did he confine his attentions to the gentler sex, then I can only say that, as far as I know, he did. I see. That explains the closet full of clothes. Beg pardon, your lordship? I mean that if a girl or woman of the lower classes were to come here, he would have proper clothing for them to wear, in spite of the sumptuary laws to the contrary. Quite likely, your lordship, he was most particular about clothing couldn't stand a woman who was sloppily dressed or poorly dressed. In what way? Well, well, for instance, I recall once when he saw a very pretty peasant girl. She was dressed in the common style, of course, but she was dressed neatly and prettily. My lord took a fancy to her. He said, Now there's a lass who knows how to wear clothes. Put her in decent apparel, and she'd pass for a princess. But a girl— who had a pretty face and a fine figure, made no impression on him unless she wore her clothing well, if you see what I mean, your lordship. Did you ever know him to fancy a girl who dressed in an off-hand manner? Lord Darcy asked. Only among the gently born, your lordship. He'd say, look at Lady So-and-so. Nice wench, if she let me teach her how to dress. You might say, your lordship, that a woman could be dressed commonly or sloppily, but not both. Judging by the stuff in that closet, Lord Darcy said, I should say that the late Count had excellent taste in feminine dress. Sir Pierre considered. Hmm. Well, now, I wouldn't exactly say so, your lordship. He knew how clothes should be worn, yes, but he couldn't pick out a woman's gown of his own accord. He could choose his own clothing with impeccable taste, but he'd not any real notion of how a woman's clothing should go, if you see what I mean. All he knew was how good clothing should be worn, but he knew nothing about design for women's clothing. "'Then how did he get that closet full of clothes?' Lord Darcy asked, puzzled. Sir Pierre chuckled. "'Very simply, your lordship. He knew that the Lady Alice had good taste.' So he secretly instructed that each piece that Lady Alice ordered should be made in duplicate, with small variations, of course. I'm certain my lady wouldn't like it if she knew. I dare say not, said Lord Darcy thoughtfully. Here is the door to the courtyard, said Sir Pierre. I doubt that it has been opened in broad daylight for many years. He selected a key from the ring of the late Count and inserted it in the keyhole. The door swung back, revealing a large crucifix attached to its outer surface. Lord Darcy crossed himself. "'Lord in heaven,' he said softly, "'what is this?' He looked out into a small shrine. It was walled off from the courtyard and had a single small entrance some ten feet from the doorway. There were four pre deus small kneading benches, ranged in front of the doorway. "'If I may explain, your lordship,' Sir Pierre began. No need to, Lord Darcy said in a hard voice. It's rather obvious. My lord the Count was quite ingenious. This is a relatively newly built shrine. Four walls and a crucifix against the castle wall. Anyone could come in here, day or night, for prayer. No one who came in would be suspected. He stepped out into the small enclosure and swung around to look at the door. And when that door is closed, there is no sign that there is a door behind the crucifix. If a woman came in here, it would be assumed that she came for prayer. But if she knew of that door—' His voice trailed off. "'Yes, your lordship,' said Sir Pierre. "'I did not approve, but I was in no position to disapprove.' "'I understand.' Lord Darcy stepped out to the doorway of the little shrine and took a quick glance about. Then anyone within the castle walls could come in here, he said. Yes, your lordship. Very well, let's go back up. End of part two.
Part Three of The Eyes Have It by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eyes Have It Part Three In the small office which Lord Darcy and his staff had been assigned while conducting the investigation, three men watched while a fourth conducted a demonstration on a table in the center of the room. Master Sean O'Loughlin held up an intricately engraved gold button with an arabesque pattern and a diamond set in the center. He looked at the other three. "'Now, my lord, your reverence, and colleague doctor, I call your attention to this button.' Dr. Pateley smiled, and Father Bright looked stern. Lord Darcy merely stuffed tobacco, imported from the southern New England counties on the Gulf, into a German-made porcelain pipe. He allowed Master Sean a certain amount of flamboyance. Good sorcerers were hard to come by. "'Will you hold the robe, Dr. Pateley? Thank you. Now stand back. That's it. Thank you. Now, I place the button on the table, a good ten feet from the robe.' Then he muttered something under his breath and dusted a bit of powder on the button. He made a few passes over it with his hands, paused, and looked up at Father Bright. "'If you will, reverend sir.' Father Bright solemnly raised his right hand, and, as he made the sign of the cross, said, "'May this demonstration, O God, be in strict accordance with the truth, and may the evil one not in any way deceive us who are witnesses thereto.' In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, the other three chorused. Master Sean crossed himself, then muttered something under his breath. The button leaped from the table, slammed itself against the robe which Dr. Pateley held before him, and stuck there as though it had been sewed on by an expert. Ha! said Master Sean, as I thought. He gave the other three men a broad, beaming smile. The two were definitely connected. Lord Darcy looked bored. Time? he asked. In a moment, my lord, Master Sean said apologetically. In a moment. While the other three watched, the sorcerer went through more spells with the button and the robe, although none were quite so spectacular as the first demonstration. Finally, Master Sean said, about eleven-thirty last night they were torn apart, my lord, but I shouldn't like to make it any more definite than to say between eleven and midnight. The speed with which it returned to its place shows that it was ripped off very rapidly, however. Very good, said Lord Darcy. Now the bullet, if you please. Yes, my lord, this will have to be a bit different. He took more paraphernalia out of his large, symbol-decorated carpet-bag. The law of contagion, gently born sirs, is a tricky thing to work with. If a man doesn't know how to handle it, he can get himself killed. We had an apprentice of the guild back in Cork who might have made a good sorcerer in time. He had the talent. Unfortunately, he didn't have the good sense to go with it. According to the law of contagion, any two objects which have ever been in contact with each other have an affinity for each other which is directly proportional to the product of the degree of relevancy of the contact and the length of time they were in contact, and inversely proportional to the length of time since they have ceased to be in contact." He gave a smiling glance to the priest. "'That doesn't apply strictly to relics of the saints, reverend sir. There's another factor enters in there, as you know.' As he spoke, the sorcerer was carefully clamping the little handgun into the padded vice, so that its barrel was parallel to the surface of the table. Anyhow, he went on, this apprentice, all on his own, decided to get rid of the cockroaches in his house, a simple thing, if one knows how to go about it. So he collected dust from various cracks and crannies about the house, dust which contained, of course, the droppings of the pests. The dust, with the appropriate spells and ingredients, he boiled. It worked fine. The roaches all came down with a raging fever and died. Unfortunately, the clumsy lad had poor laboratory technique. He allowed three drops of his own perspiration to fall into the steaming pot over which he was working, and the resulting fever killed him too. 
By this time he had put the bullet which Dr. Pateley had removed from the Count's body on a small pedestal, so that it was exactly in line with the muzzle of the gun. "'There, now,' he said softly. Then he repeated the incantation, and the powdering that he had used on the button. As the last syllable was formed by his lips, the bullet vanished with a ping. In its vice the little gun vibrated. "'Ah,' said Master Sean, "'no question there, eh? That's the death weapon, all right, my lord. Yes. Time's almost exactly the same as that of the removal of the button. Not more than a few seconds later. Forms a picture, don't it, my lord? His lordship the Count jerks a button off the girl's gown, she outs the gun, and plugs him.' Lord Darcy's handsome face scowled. "'Let's not jump to any hasty conclusions, my good Sean. There is no evidence whatever that he was killed by a woman.' "'Would a man be wearing that gown, my lord?' "'Possibly,' said Lord Darcy. "'But who says that anyone was wearing it when the button was removed?' "'Oh!' Master Sean subsided into silence. Using a small ramrod, he forced the bullet out of the chamber of the little pistol. "'Father Bright,' said Lord Darcy, "'will the Countess be serving tea this afternoon?' The priest looked suddenly contrite. "'Good heavens! None of you has eaten yet. I'll see that something is sent up right away, Lord Darcy. In the confusion—' Lord Darcy held up a hand. "'I beg your pardon, father. That wasn't what I meant.' I'm sure Master Sean and Dr. Pateley would appreciate a little something, but I can wait until tea-time. What I was thinking was that perhaps the Countess would ask her guests to tea. Does she know Laird and Lady Duncan well enough to ask for their sympathetic presence on such an afternoon as this?" Father Bright's eyes narrowed a trifle. "'I dare say it could be arranged, Lord Darcy. Will you be there?' "'Yes, but I may be a trifle late. That will hardly matter at an informal tea." The priest glanced at his watch. Four o'clock? "'I should think that would do it,' said Lord Darcy. Father Bright nodded wordlessly and left the room. Dr. Pateley took off his pince-nez and polished the lenses carefully with a silk handkerchief. "'How long will your spell keep the body incorrupt, Master Sean?' he asked. As long as it's relevant. As soon as the case is solved, or we have enough data to solve the case, as the case may be, <laughs> he'll start to go. I'm not a saint, you know. It takes powerful motivation to keep a body incorrupt for years and years." Sir Pierre was eyeing the gown that Pateley had put on the table. The button was still in place, as if held there by magnetism. He didn't touch it. Master Sean. I don't know much about magic," he said, but can't you find out who was wearing this robe just as easily as you found out that the button matched?" Master Sean wagged his head in a firm negative. "'No, sir. Tisn't relevant, sir. The relevancy of the integrated dress as a whole is quite strong. So is that of the seamstress or tailor who made the garment, and that of the waver who made the cloth. But except in certain circumstances, the person who wears or wore the garment has little actual relevancy to the garment itself." "'I'm afraid I don't understand,' said Sir Pierre, looking puzzled. "'Look at it like this, sir. That gown wouldn't be what it is if the waver hadn't made the cloth in that particular way. It wouldn't be what it is if the seamstress hadn't cut it in a particular way and sewed it in a specific manner. You follow, sir? Yes. Well, then. The connections between garment and weaver and garment and seamstress are strongly relevant. But this dress would still be pretty much what it is if it had stayed in the closet instead of being worn. No relevance, or very little. Now, if it were a well-worn garment, that would be different, that is, if it had always been worn by the same person. Then, you see, sir, the garment as a whole is what it is because of the wearing, and the wearer becomes relevant. He pointed at the little handgun he was holding in his hand. "'Now, you take your gun here, sir. The—' "'It isn't my gun,' Sir Pierre interrupted firmly. "'I was speaking rhetorically, sir,' said Master Sean, with infinite patience. "'This gun, or any other gun in general, if you see what I mean, sir. 
it's even harder to place the ownership of a gun. Most of the wear on a gun is purely mechanical. It don't matter who pulls the trigger, you see, the erosion by the gases produced in the chamber and the wear caused by the bullet passing through the barrel will be the same. You see, sir, tisn't relevant to the gun who pulled its trigger or what it's fired at. The bullet's a slightly different matter. To the bullet, it is relevant which gun it was fired from and what it hit. All these things simply have to be taken into account, Sir Pierre." "'I see,' said the knight. "'Very interesting, Master Sean.' Then he turned to Lord Darcy. "'Is there anything else, Your Lordship? There's a great deal of county business to be attended to.' Lord Darcy waved a hand. "'Not at the moment, Sir Pierre. I understand the pressures of government. Go right ahead.' "'Thank you, Your Lordship. If anything further should be required, I shall be in my office." As soon as Sir Pierre had closed the door, Lord Darcy held out his hand toward the sorcerer. "'Master Sean, the gun?' Master Sean handed it to him. "'Ever see one like it before?' he asked, turning it over in his hands. "'Not exactly like it, my lord.' "'Come, come, Sean, don't be so cautious. I'm no sorcerer but I don't need to know the laws of similarity to be able to recognize an obvious similarity." "'Edinburgh,' said Master Sean flatly. "'Exactly. Scottish work. The typical Scot gold work. Remarkable beauty. And look at that luck. It has Scots written all over it, and more. Edinburgh, you said." Dr. Pateley, having replaced his carefully polished glasses, leaned over and peered at the weapon in Lord Darcy's hand. "'Couldn't it be Italian, my lord? Or Moorish? In Moorish Spain they do work like that.' "'No Moorish gunsmith would put a hunting scene on the butt,' Lord Darcy said flatly. "'And the Italians wouldn't have put heather and thistles in the field surrounding the huntsman.' "'But the FDM engraved on the barrel,' said Dr. Pateley, "'indicates the—' Ferrari of Milan," said Lord Darcy. Exactly. But the barrel is of much newer work than the rest. So are the chambers. This is a fairly old gun, fifty years old, I'd say. The lock and the butt are still in excellent condition, indicating that it has been well cared for. But frequent usage, or a single accident, could ruin the barrel and require the owner to get a replacement. It was replaced by Ferrari. I see said Dr. Pateley, somewhat humbled. "'If we open the lock, Master Sean, hand me your small screwdriver. Thank you. If we open the lock, we will find the name of one of the finest gunsmiths of half a century ago, a man whose name has not yet been forgotten, Hamish Graw of Edinburgh. Ah, there, you see?' They did. Having satisfied himself on that point, Lord Darcy closed the lock again. Now, men, we have the gun located. We also know that a guest in this very castle is Laird Duncan of Duncan, the Duncan of Duncan himself. A Scots Laird who was, fifteen years ago, His Majesty's Minister Plenipotentiary to the Free Grand Duchy of Milan. That suggests to me that it would be indeed odd if there were not some connection between Laird Duncan and this gun. Eh? "'Come, come, Master Sean,' said Lord Darcy, rather impatiently. "'We haven't all the time in the world.' "'Patience, my lord, patience,' said the little sorcerer calmly. "'Can't hurry these things, you know.' He was kneeling in front of a large, heavy travelling chest in the bedroom of the guest apartment occupied temporarily by Laird and Lady Duncan, working on the lock. "'One position of a lock is just as relevant as the other, so you can't work with the bolt.' But the pin tumblers on the cylinder now, that's a different matter. A lock's built so that the brakes and the tumblers are not related to the surface of the cylinder when the key is out, but there is a relation when the key's in. So, by taking advantage of that relevancy, ah! The lock clicked open. Lord Darcy raised the lid gently. Carefully, my lord, Master Sean said in a warning voice. He's got a spell on the thing. Let me do it." He made Lord Darcy stand back and then lifted the lid of the heavy trunk himself. 
when it was leaning back against the wall, gaping open widely on its hinges, Master Sean took a long look at the trunk and its lid without touching either of them. There was a second lid on the trunk, a thin one obviously operated by a simple bolt. Master Sean took his sorcerer's staff, a five-foot, heavy rod made of the wood of the quicken-tree or mountain-ash, and touched the inner lid. Nothing happened. He touched the bolt. Nothing. Hmm, Master Sean murmured thoughtfully. He glanced around the room, and his eyes fell on a heavy stone doorstop. That ought to do it. He walked over, picked it up, and carried it back to the chest. Then he put it on the rim of the chest in such a position that if the lid were to fall, it would be stopped by the doorstop. Then he put his hand in as if to lift the inner lid. The heavy outer lid swung forward and down of its own accord, moving with a blurring speed, and slammed viciously against the doorstop. Lord Darcy massaged his right wrist gently, as if he felt where the lid would have hit if he had tried to open the inner lid. Trigger to slam if a human being sticks a hand in there, eh? Or a head, my lord. Not very effectual, if you know what to look for. There are better spells than that for guarding things. Now we'll see what his lordship wants to protect so badly that he practices sorcery without a license. He lifted the lid again, and then opened the inner lid. It's safe now, my lord. Look at this. Lord Darcy had already seen. Both men looked in silence at the collection of paraphernalia on the first tray of the chest. Master Sean's busy fingers carefully opened the tissue-paper packing of one after another of the objects. A human skull, he said. Bottles of graveyard earth. Hmm. This one is labeled virgin's blood. And this, a hand of glory. It was a mummified human hand, stiff and dry and brown, with the fingers partially curled, as though they were holding an invisible ball three inches or so in diameter. On each of the fingertips was a short candle stub. When the hand was placed on its back, it would act as a candelabra. "'That pretty much settles it, eh, Master Sean?' Lord Darcy said. "'Indeed, my lord. At the very least, we can get him for possession of materials. Black magic is a matter of symbolism and intent.' "'Very well. I want a complete list of the contents of that chest. Be sure to replace everything as it was, and relock the trunk.' He tugged thoughtfully at an earlobe. "'So, Laird Duncan has the talent, eh? Interesting.' "'Aye, but not surprising, my lord,' said Master Sean, without looking up from his work. "'It's in the blood. Some attribute it to the Dedanans, who passed through Scotland before they conquered Ireland three thousand years ago. But, however that may be, the talent runs strong in the Sons of Gael. It makes me boil to see it misused.' While Master Sean talked, Lord Darcy was prowling around the room, reminding one of a lean tomcat who was certain that there was a mouse concealed somewhere. "'It'll make Laird Duncan boil if he isn't stopped,' Lord Darcy murmured absently. "'Aye, my lord,' said Master Sean. "'The mental state necessary to use the talent for black sorcery is such that it invariably destroys the user. But if he knows what he's doing, a lot of other people are hurt before he finally gets his.' Lord Darcy opened the jewel-box on the dresser the usual travelling jewellery, enough but not a great choice. "'A man's mind turns in on itself when he's taken up with hatred and thoughts of revenge,' Master Sean droned on. "'Or, if he's the type who enjoys watching others suffer, or the type who doesn't care but is willing to do anything for gain, then his mind is already warped and the misuse of the talent just makes it worse.' Lord Darcy found what he was looking for in a drawer just underneath some neatly folded lingerie. A small holster, beautifully made of Florentine leather, gilded and tooled. He didn't need Master Sean's sorcery to tell him that the little pistol fitted like a hand in a glove. Father Bright felt as though he had been walking a tightrope for hours. Laird and Lady Duncan had been talking in low, controlled voices that betrayed an inner nervousness, but Father Bright realized that he and the Countess had been doing the same thing. The Duncan of Duncan had offered his condolences on the death of the late Count with the proper air of suppressed sorrow, as had Mary Lady Duncan. 
The Countess had accepted them solemnly and with gratitude. But Father Bright was well aware that no one in the room, possibly, he thought, no one in the world, regretted the Count's passing. Laird Duncan sat in his wheelchair, his sharp Scots features set in a sad smile that showed an intent to be affable even though great sorrow weighed heavily upon him. Father Bright noticed it and realized that his own face had the same sort of expression. No one was fooling anyone else, of that the priest was certain, but for anyone to admit it would be the most boorish breach of etiquette. But there was a haggardness, a look of increased age about the laird's countenance that Father Bright did not like. His priestly intuition told him, clearly, that there was a turmoil of emotion in the Scotsman's mind that was, well, evil was the only word for it. Lady Duncan was, for the most part, silent. In the past fifteen minutes, since she and her husband had come to the informal tea, she had spoken scarcely a dozen words. Her face was mask-like, but there was the same look of haggardness about her eyes as there was in her husband's face but the priest's emphatic sense told him that the emotion here was fear, simple and direct. His keen eyes had noticed that she wore a shade too much makeup. She had almost succeeded in covering up the faint bruise on her right cheek, but not completely. My lady the Countess de Vreau was all sadness and unhappiness, but there was neither fear nor evil there. She smiled politely and talked quietly. Father Bright would have been willing to bet that not one of the four of them would remember a word that had been spoken. Father Bright had placed his chair so that he could keep an eye on the open doorway and the long hall that led in from the great keep. He hoped Lord Darcy would hurry. Neither of the guests had been told that the Duke's investigator was here, and Father Bright was just a little apprehensive about the meeting. The Duncans had not even been told that the Count's death had been murder but he was certain that they knew. Father Bright saw Lord Darcy coming through the door at the far end of the hall. He murmured a polite excuse and rose. The other three accepted his excuses with the same politeness and went on with their talk. Father Bright met Lord Darcy in the hall. "'Did you find what you were looking for, Lord Darcy?' the priest asked in a low tone. "'Yes,' Lord Darcy said. I'm afraid we shall have to arrest Laird Duncan. Murder? Perhaps. I'm not yet certain of that. But the charge will be black magic. He has all the paraphernalia in a chest in his room. Master Sean reports that a ritual was enacted in the bedroom last night. Of course that's out of my jurisdiction. You, as a representative of the Church, will have to be the arresting officer." He paused. "'You don't seem surprised, Reverence. I'm not," Father Bright admitted. I felt it. You and Master Sean will have to make out a sworn deposition before I can act. I understand. Can you do me a favor? If I can. Get my lady the Countess out of the room on some pretext or other. Leave me alone with her guests. I do not wish to upset my lady any more than absolutely necessary. I think I can do that. Shall we go in together? Why not? But don't mention why I'm here. Let them assume I am just another guest. Very well." All three occupants of the room glanced up as Father Bright came in with Lord Darcy. The introductions were made. Lord Darcy humbly begged the pardon of his hostess for his lateness. Father Bright noticed the same sad smile on Lord Darcy's handsome face as the others were wearing. Lord Darcy helped himself from the buffet table and allowed the Countess to pour him a large cup of hot tea. He mentioned nothing about the recent death. Instead, he turned the conversation toward the wild beauty of Scotland and the excellence of the grouse shooting there. Father Bright had not sat down again. Instead, he left the room once more. When he returned, he went directly to the Countess and said, in a low but clearly audible voice, "'My lady,' Sir Pierre Morlay has informed me that there are a few matters that require your attention immediately. It will require only a few moments." My lady the Countess did not hesitate, but made her excuses immediately. "'Do finish your tea,' she said. "'I don't think I shall be long.'" Lord Darcy knew the priest would not lie, 
and he wondered what sort of arrangement had been made with Sir Pierre. Not that it mattered, except that Lord Darcy had hoped it would be sufficiently involved for it to keep the Countess busy for at least ten minutes. The conversation, interrupted but momentarily, returned to Grouse. "'I haven't done any shooting since my accident,' said Lord Duncan, "'but I used to enjoy it immensely. I still have friends up every year for the season.' "'What sort of weapon do you prefer for Grouse?' Lord Darcy asked. "'A one-inch bore with a modified choke,' said the Scot. "'I have a pair that I favour. Excellent weapons.' "'Of Scottish make?' "'No, no, English. Your London gunsmiths can't be beat for shotguns.' "'Oh, I thought perhaps your lordship had had all your guns made in Scotland.' As he spoke, he took out the little pistol out of his coat-pocket and put it carefully on the table. There was a sudden silence, then Laird Duncan said in an angry voice, "'What is this? Where did you get that?' Lord Duncan glanced at Lady Duncan, who had turned suddenly pale. "'Perhaps,' he said coolly, "'Lady Duncan can tell us.' She shook her head and gasped. For a moment she had trouble in forming words or finding her voice. Finally, "'No, no, I know nothing, nothing.' But Laird Duncan looked at her oddly. "'You do not deny that is your gun, my lord?' Lord Darcy asked. "'Or your wife's, as the case may be.' "'Where did you get it?' There was a dangerous quality in the Scotsman's voice. He had once been a powerful man, and Lord Darcy could see his shoulder muscles bunching. "'From the late Count de Vreau's bedroom.' "'What was it doing there?' There was a snarl in the Scot's voice, but Lord Darcy had the feeling that the question was as much directed toward Lady Duncan as it was to himself. One of the things it was doing there was shooting Count de Vreau through the heart. Lady Duncan slumped forward in a dead faint, overturning her teacup. Laird Duncan made a grab at the gun, ignoring his wife. Lord Darcy's hand snaked out and picked up the weapon before the Scot could touch it. "'No, no, my lord.' he said mildly. This is evidence in a murder case. We mustn't tamper with the King's evidence." He wasn't prepared for what happened next. Laird Duncan roared something obscene in Scots Gaelic, put his hands on the arms of his wheelchair, and, with a great thrust of his powerful arms and shoulders, shoved himself up and forward toward Lord Darcy, across the table from him. His arm swung up toward Lord Darcy's throat as the momentum of his body carried him toward the investigator. He might have made it, but the weakness of his legs betrayed him. His waist struck the edge of the massive oaken table, and most of his forward momentum was lost. He collapsed forward, his hands still grasping toward the surprised Englishman. His chin came down hard on the tabletop. Then he slid back, taking the tablecloth and the china and the silverware with him. He lay unmoving on the floor. His wife did not even stir except when the tablecloth tugged at her head. Lord Darcy had jumped back, overturning his chair. He stood on his feet, looking at the two unconscious forms. End of Part 3this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eyes Have It Part 4 "'I don't think there's any permanent damage done to either,' said Dr. Pateley an hour later. "'Lady Duncan was suffering from shock, of course, but Father Bright brought her round in a hurry.' She's a devout woman, I think, even if a sinful one. "'What about Laird Duncan?' Lord Darcy asked. "'Well, that's a different matter. I'm afraid that his back injury was aggravated, and that crack on the chin didn't do him any good. I don't know whether Father Bright can help him or not. Healing takes the cooperation of the patient. I did all I could for him, but I'm just a surgeon, not a practitioner of the healing art.' Father Bright has quite a good reputation in that line, however, and he may be able to do his lordship some good." Master Sean shook his head dolefully. 
His reverence has the talent, there's no doubt of that. But now he's pitted against another man who has it, a man whose mind is bent on self-destruction in the long run. "'Well, that's none of my affair,' said Dr. Pateley. "'I'm just a technician. I'll leave the healing up to the church where it belongs.' "'Master Sean,' said Lord Darcy, "'there is still a mystery here. We need more evidence. What about the eyes?' Master Sean blinked. "'You mean the picture test, my lord?' "'I do.' "'It won't stand up in court, my lord,' said the sorcerer. "'I'm aware of that,' said Lord Darcy testily. "'I test?' Dr. Pateley asked blankly. "'I don't believe I understand.' "'It's not often used,' said Master Sean. "'It's a psychic phenomenon that sometimes occurs at the moment of death, especially a violent death. The violent emotional stress causes a sort of backfiring of the mind, if you see what I mean. As a result, the image in the mind of the dying person is returned to the retina. By using the proper sorcery, this image can be developed and the last thing the dead man saw can be brought out. But it's a difficult process, even under the best of circumstances, and usually the conditions aren't right. In the first place, it doesn't always occur. It never occurs, for instance, when the person is expecting the attack. A man who is killed in a duel, or is shot after facing the gun for several seconds, has time to adjust to the situation. Also, death must occur almost instantly. If he lingers, even for a few minutes, the effect is lost. And, naturally, if the person's eyes are closed at the instant of death, nothing shows up. "'Count de Vreau's eyes were open,' Dr. Paley said. "'They were still open when we found him. How long after death does the image remain?' "'Until the cells of the retina die and lose their identity. Rarely more than twenty-four hours, usually much less.' "'It hasn't been twenty-four hours yet,' said Lord Darcy and there is a chance that the Count was taken completely by surprise. "'I must admit, my lord,' Master Sean said thoughtfully, "'that the conditions seem favourable. I shall attempt it, but don't put any hopes on it, my lord. I shan't. Just do your best, Master Sean. If there is a sorcerer in practice who can do the job, it is you.' "'Thank you, my lord. I'll get busy on it right away.' said the sorcerer with a subdued glow of pride. Two hours later Lord Darcy was striding down the corridor of the great hall, Master Sean following up as best he could, his queer and wood staff in one hand and his big carpet-bag in the other. He had asked Father Bright and the Countess de Vreau to meet him in one of the smaller guest-rooms, but the Countess came to meet him. "'My Lord Darcy,' she said, her plain face looking worried and unhappy, is it true that you suspect Laird and Lady Duncan of this murder? Because, if so, I must—' "'No longer, my lady,' Lord Darcy cut her off quickly. "'I think we can show that neither is guilty of murder, although, of course, the black magic charge must still be held against Laird Duncan.' "'I understand,' she said. "'But—' "'Please, my lady,' Lord Darcy interrupted again, "'let me explain everything. Come.' Without another word, she turned and led the way to the room where Father Bright was waiting. The priest stood waiting, his face showing tenseness. "'Please,' said Lord Darcy, "'sit down, both of you. This won't take long.' "'My lady, may Master Sean make use of that table over there?' "'Certainly, my lord,' the Countess said softly. "'Certainly.' "'Thank you, my lady. Please, please, sit down. This won't take long. Please.' With apparent reluctance, Father Bright and my lady the Countess sat down in two chairs facing Lord Darcy. They paid little attention to what Master Sean O'Loughlin was doing. Their eyes were on Lord Darcy. "'Conducting an investigation of this sort is not an easy thing,' he began carefully. "'Most murder cases could be easily solved by your chief man-at-arms.' We find that well-trained county police, in by far the majority of cases, can solve the mystery easily, and in most cases there is very little mystery. But by His Imperial Majesty's law, 
the chief man-at-arms must call in a duke's investigator if the crime is insoluble, or if it involves a member of the aristocracy. For that reason, you were perfectly correct to call His Highness the Duke as soon as murder had been discovered." He leaned back in his chair. "'And it has been clear from the first that my lord the late Count was murdered.' Father Bright started to say something, but Lord Darcy cut him off before he could speak. "'By murder, Reverend Father, I mean that he did not die a natural death, by disease or heart trouble or accident or what have you. I should, perhaps, use the word homicide. Now the question we have been called upon to answer is simply this. Who was responsible for the homicide?" The priest and the countess remained silent, looking at Lord Darcy as though he were some sort of divinely inspired oracle. As you know, pardon me, my lady, if I am blunt, the late Count was somewhat of a playboy. No, I will make that stronger. He was a satyr, a lecher. He was a man with a sexual obsession. For such a man, if he indulges in his passions, which the late Count most certainly did, there is usually but one end. Unless he is a man who has a winsome personality, which he did not, there will be someone who will hate him enough to kill him. Such a man inevitably leaves behind him a trail of wronged women and wronged men. One such person may kill him. One such person did. But we must find the person who did, and determine the extent of his or her guilt. That is my purpose. Now as to the facts. We know that Edward has a secret stairway which led directly to his suite. Actually, the secret was poorly kept. There were many women, common and noble, who knew of the existence of that stairway and knew how to enter it. If Edward left the lower door unlocked, anyone could come up that stairway. He has another lock in the door of his bedroom, so only someone who was invited could come in, even if she, or he, could get into the stairway. He was protected. Now here is what actually happened that night. I have evidence, by the way, and I have the confessions of both Laird and Lady Duncan. I will explain how I got those confessions in a moment. Primus. Lady Duncan had an assignation with Count de Vreau last night. She went up the stairway to his room. She was carrying with her a small pistol. She had had an affair with Edward, and she had been rebuffed. She was furious, but she went to his room. He was drunk when she arrived, in one of the nasty moods with which both of you are familiar. She pleaded with him to accept her again as his mistress. He refused. According to Lady Duncan, he said, I don't want you. You're not fit to be in the same room with her. The emphasis is Lady Duncan's, not my own. Furious, she drew a gun, the little pistol which killed him. The Countess gasped. But Mary couldn't have— Please! Lord Darcy slammed the palm of his hand on the arm of his chair with an explosive sound. My lady, you will listen to what I have to say. He was taking a devil of a chance, he knew. The Countess was his hostess and had every right to exercise her prerogatives. But Lord Darcy was counting on the fact that she had been under Count de Vreau's influence so long that it would take her a little time to realize that she no longer had to knuckle under to the will of a man who shouted at her. He was right. She became silent. Father Bright turned to her quickly and said, "'Please, my daughter, wait.' "'Your pardon, my lady,' Lord Darcy continued smoothly. "'I was about to explain to you why I know Lady Duncan could not have killed your brother. There is the matter of the dress. We are certain that the gown that was found in Edward's closet was worn by the killer. And that gown could not possibly have fit Lady Duncan. She is much too, er, uh, hefty. She has told me her story, and for reasons I will give you later, I believe it. When she pointed the gun at your brother, she really had no intention of killing him. She had no intention of pulling the trigger. Your brother knew this. He lashed out and slapped the side of her head. She dropped the pistol and fell, sobbing to the floor. He took her roughly by the arm and escorted her down the stairway. 
he threw her out. Lady Duncan, hysterical, ran to her husband. And then, when he had succeeded in calming her down a bit, she realized the position she was in. She knew that Laird Duncan was a violent, a warped man, very similar to Edward Count de Vreau. She dared not tell him the truth, but she had to tell him something. So she lied. She told him that Edward had asked her up in order to tell her something of importance, that that something of importance concerned Laird Duncan's safety, that the Count told her that he knew of Laird Duncan's dabbling in black magic, that he threatened to inform church authorities on Laird Duncan unless she submitted to his desires, that she had struggled with him and ran away. Lord Darcy spread his hands. This was, of course, a tissue of lies. But Laird Duncan believed everything. So great was his ego that he could not believe in her infidelity, although he has been paralyzed for five years. "'How can you be certain that Lady Duncan told the truth?' Father Bright asked warily. Aside from the matter of the gown, which Count de Vreau kept only for women of the common class, not the aristocracy, we have the testimony of the actions of Laird Duncan himself. We come then to Secundus. Laird Duncan could not have committed the murder physically. How could a man who was confined to a wheelchair go up that flight of stairs? I submit to you that it would have been physically impossible. The possibility that he has been pretending all these years, and that he is actually capable of walking, was disproved three hours ago, when he actually injured himself by trying to throttle me. His legs are incapable of carrying him even one step, much less carrying him to the top of that stairway." Lord Darcy folded his hands complacently. "'There remains,' said Father Bright, "'the possibility that Laird Duncan killed Count de Vreau by psychical, by magical means.' Lord Darcy nodded. "'That is indeed possible, reverend sir, as we both know. But not in this instance.' Master Sean assures me, and I am certain that you will concur, that a man killed by sorcery, by black magic, dies of internal malfunction, not of a bullet through the heart. In effect, the black sorcerer induces his enemy to kill himself by psychosomatic means. He dies by what is technically known as psychic induction. Master Sean informs me that the commonest and crudest method of doing this is by the so-called simulacrum induction method. That is, by the making of an image, usually but not necessarily of wax, and using the law of similarity, inducing death. The law of contagion is also used, since the fingernails, hair, spittle, and so on of the victim are usually incorporated into the image. Am I correct, father?" The priest nodded. Yes, and, contrary to the heresies of certain materialists, it is not at all necessary that the victim be informed of the operation, although, admittedly, it can, in certain circumstances, aid the process." Exactly, said Lord Darcy. But it is well known that material objects can be moved by a competent sorcerer, black or white. Would you explain to my lady the Countess why her brother could not have been killed in that manner? Father Bright touched his lips with the tip of his tongue and then turned to the girl sitting next to him. There is a lack of relevancy. In this case, the bullet must have been relevant either to the heart or to the gun. To have traveled with a velocity great enough to penetrate, the relevancy to the heart must have been much greater than the relevancy to the gun. Yet the test, witnessed by myself, that was performed by Master Sean, indicates that this was not so. The bullet returned to the gun, not to your brother's heart. The evidence, my dear, is conclusive that the bullet was propelled by purely physical means, and was propelled from the gun." "'Then what was it Laird Duncan did?' the Countess asked. "'Tertius,' said Lord Darcy. Believing what his wife had told him, Laird Duncan flew into a rage. He determined to kill your brother. He used an induction spell but the spell backfired and almost killed him. There are analogies on a material plane. If one adds mineral spirits and air to a fire, the fire will be increased, but if one adds ash, the fire will be put out. In a similar manner, 
If one attacks a living being psychically, it will die. But if one attacks a dead thing in such a manner, the psychic energy will be absorbed, to the detriment of the person who has used it. In theory, we could charge Laird Duncan with attempted murder, for there is no doubt that he did attempt to kill your brother, my lady. But your brother was already dead at the time." The resultant dissipation of psychic energy rendered Laird Duncan unconscious for several hours, during which Lady Duncan waited in suspenseful fear. Finally, when Laird Duncan regained consciousness, he realized what had happened. He knew that your brother was already dead when he attempted the spell. He thought, therefore, that Lady Duncan had killed the Count. On the other hand, Lady Duncan was perfectly well aware that she had left Edward alive and well. So she thought the black magic of her husband had killed her erstwhile lover. Each was trying to protect the other, Father Bright said. Neither is completely evil, then. There may be something we can do for Laird Duncan." "'I wouldn't know about that, Father,' Lord Darcy said. "'The healing art is the Church's business, not mine.' He realized with some amusement that he was paraphrasing Dr. Pateley. "'What Laird Duncan had not known,' he went on quickly, "'was that his wife had taken a gun up to the Count's bedroom. That put a rather different light on her visit, you see.' That's why he flew into such a towering rage at me, not because I was accusing him or his wife of murder, but because I had cast doubt on his wife's behavior." He turned his head to look at the table where the Irish sorcerer was working. "'Ready, Master Sean?' "'Aye, my lord. All I have to do is set up the screen and light the lantern in the projector.' "'Go ahead, then.' He looked back at Father Bright and the Countess. Master Sean has a rather interesting lantern slide I want you to look at. The most successful development I've ever made, if I may say so, my lord, the sorcerer said. Proceed. Master Sean opened the shutter on the projector, and a picture sprang into being on the screen. There were gasps from Father Bright and the Countess. It was a woman. She was wearing the gown that had hung in the Count's closet. A button had been torn off and the gown gaped open. Her right hand was almost completely obscured by a dense cloud of smoke. Obviously, she had just fired a pistol directly at the onlooker. But that was not what had caused the gasps. The girl was beautiful, gloriously, ravishingly beautiful. It was not a delicate beauty. There was nothing flower-like or peaceful in it. It was a beauty that could have but one effect on a normal human male. She was the most physically desirable woman one could imagine. Retromia, Satanus, Father Bright thought wryly. She's almost obscenely beautiful. Only the Countess was unaffected by the desirability of the image. She saw only the startling beauty. Has neither of you seen that woman before? I thought not, said Lord Darcy. Nor had Laird or Lady Duncan, nor Sir Pierre. Who is she, we don't know, but we can make a few deductions. She must have come to the Count's room by appointment. This is quite obviously the woman Edward mentioned to Lady Duncan, the woman, the she, that the Scots noblewoman could not compare with. It is almost certain she is a commoner, otherwise she would not be wearing a robe from the Count's collection. She must have changed right there in the bedroom. Then she and the Count quarrelled about what we do not know. The Count had previously taken Lady Duncan's pistol away from her, and had evidently carelessly let it lay on the table you see behind the girl. She grabbed it and shot him. Then she changed clothes again, hung up the robe, and ran away. No one saw her come or go. The Count had designed the stairway for just that purpose. Oh, we'll find her, never fear, now that we know what she looks like. At any rate, Lord Darcy concluded, the mystery is now solved to my complete satisfaction, and I shall so report to His Highness. Richard, Duke of Normandy, poured two liberal portions of excellent brandy into a pair of crystal goblets. There was a smile of satisfaction on his youthful face as he handed one of the goblets to Lord Darcy. Very well done, my lord, he said. Very well done. I am gratified to hear your highness say so," 
said Lord Darcy, accepting the brandy. But how were you so certain that it was not someone from outside the castle? Anyone could have come in through the main gate. That's always open. True, Your Highness, but the door at the foot of the stairway was locked. Count de Vreau locked it after he threw Lady Duncan out. There was no way of locking or unlocking it from the outside. The door had not been forced. No one could have come in that way, nor left that way, after Lady Duncan was so forcibly ejected. The only other way into the Count's suite was by the other door, and that door was unlocked. "'I see,' said Duke Richard. "'I wonder why she went up there in the first place.' probably because he asked her to. Any other woman would have known what she was getting into if she accepted an invitation to Count de Vreau's suite. The Duke's handsome face darkened. No, one would hardly expect that sort of thing from one's own brother. She was perfectly justified in shooting him. Perfectly, Your Highness. And had she been anyone but the heiress, she would undoubtedly have confessed immediately. Indeed, it was all I could do to keep her from confessing to me when she thought I was going to charge the Duncans with the killing. But she knew that it was necessary to preserve the reputation of her brother and herself. Not as private persons, but as Count and Countess, as officers of the government of His Imperial Majesty the King. For a man to be known as a rake is one thing. Most people don't care about that sort of thing in a public official so long as he does his duty and does it well which, as your highness knows, the Count did. But to be shot to death while attempting to assault his own sister, that is quite another thing. She was perfectly justified in attempting to cover it up. And she will remain silent unless someone else is accused of the crime." "'Which, of course, will not happen,' said Duke Richard. He sipped at the brandy, then said, "'She will make a good Countess. She has judgment and she can keep cool under duress. After she had shot her own brother, she might have panicked, but she didn't. How many women would have thought of simply taking off the damaged gown and putting on its duplicate from the closet? Very few, Lord Darcy agreed. That's why I never mentioned that I knew the Count's wardrobe contained dresses identical to her own. By the way, Your Highness, if any good healer, like Father Bright, had known of those duplicate dresses, he would have realized that the Count had a sexual obsession about his sister. He would have known that all the other women the Count went after were sister substitutes. Yes, of course, and none of them measure up. He put his goblet on the table. I shall inform the King my brother that I recommend the new Countess wholeheartedly. No word of this must be put down in writing, of course. You know, and I know, and the King must know. No one else must know." "'One other knows,' said Lord Darcy. "'Who? Father Bright.' Duke Richard looked relieved. Naturally. He won't tell her that we know, will he?" "'I think Father Bright's discretion can be relied upon.' In the dimness of the confessional, Alice, Countess de Vreau, knelt and listened to the voice of Father Bright. I shall not give you any penance, my child, for you have committed no sin, that is, in so far as the death of your brother is concerned. For the rest of your sins, you must read and memorize the third chapter of The Soul and the World by St. James Huntington. He started to pronounce the absolution, but the Countess said, I don't understand one thing. That picture, that wasn't me. I never saw such a gorgeously beautiful girl in my life and I'm so plain. I don't understand." Had you looked more closely, my child, you would have seen that the face did look like yours, only it was idealized. When a subjective reality is made objective, distortions invariably show up. That is why such things cannot be accepted as evidence of objective reality in court." He paused. To put it another way, my child, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The End of The Eyes Have It by Randall Garrett Beyond Lies the Wub by Philip K. Dick 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan McAdam. The slovenly wub might well have said, Many men talk like philosophers and live like fools. They had almost finished with the loading. Outside stood Optus, his arms folded, his face sunk in gloom. Captain Franco walked leisurely down the gangplank, grinning. What's the matter? he said. You're getting paid for all this. The Optus said nothing. He turned away, collecting his robes. The captain put his boot on the hem of the robe. Just a minute. Don't go off. I'm not finished. Oh? The Optus turned with dignity. I am going back to the village. He looked towards the animals and birds being driven up the gangplank into the spaceship. I must organize new hunts. Franco lit a cigarette. Why not? You people can go out into the veldt and track it all down again. But when we run out halfway between Mars and Earth... The Optus went off, wordless. Franco joined the first mate at the bottom of the gangplank. How's it coming? He said. He looked at his watch. We got a good bargain here. The mate glanced at him sourly. How do you explain that? What's the matter with you? We need it more than they do. I'll see you later, Captain. The mate threaded his way up the plank, between the long-legged Martian go-bird into the ship. Franco watched him disappear. He was just starting up after him, up the plank towards the port, when he saw it. My God! He stood staring, his hands on his hips. Peterson was walking along the path, his face red, leading it by a string. I'm sorry, Captain he said, tugging at the string. Franco walked towards him. What is it? The wub stood sagging, its great body settling slowly. It was sitting down, its eyes half shut. A few flies buzzed about its flank, and it switched its tail. It sat. There was silence. It's a wub, Peterson said. I got it from a native for 50 cents. He said it was a very unusual animal, very respected. This... Franco poked the great sloping side of the wub. It's a pig. A huge, dirty pig. Yes, sir, it's a pig. The natives call it a wub. A huge pig. Must weigh 400 pounds. Franco grabbed a tuft of the rough hair. The wub gasped. Its eyes opened, small and moist. Then its great mouth twitched. A tear rolled down the wub's cheek and splashed onto the floor. Maybe it's good to eat, Peterson said nervously. We'll soon find out, Franco said. The wub survived the takeoff, sound asleep in the hold of the ship. When they were out in space and everything was running smoothly, Captain Franco bade his men fetch the wub upstairs so that he might perceive what manner of beast it was. The wub grunted and wheezed, squeezing up the passageway. Come on, Jones grated, pulling at the rope. The wub twisted, rubbing its skin off on the smooth chrome walls. It burst into the anteroom, tumbling down in a heap. The men leaped up. Good lord, French said. What is it? Peterson says it's a wub, Jones said. It belongs to him. He kicked at the wub. The wub stood up unsteadily, panting. What's the matter with it? French came over. Is it going to be sick? They watched. The wub rolled its eyes mournfully and gazed around at the men. I think it's thirsty, Peterson said. He went to go get some water. French shook his head. No wonder we had so much trouble taking off. I had to reset all my ballast calculations. Peter came back with the water. The wub began to lap gratefully, splashing the men. Captain Franco appeared at the door. Let's have a look at it, he advanced, squinting critically. You got this for 50 cents? Yes, sir, Peterson said. It eats almost anything. I fed it on grain and it liked that, and then potatoes and mash and scraps from the table and milk. It seems to enjoy eating. After it eats, it lies down and goes to sleep. I see, Captain Franco said. Now, as to taste, that's the real question. I doubt if there's much point in fattening it up any more. It seems fat enough to me already. Where's the cook? I want him here. I want to find out. The wub stopped lapping and looked up at the captain. Really, Captain, the wub said. I suggest we talk of other matters. 
The room was silent. What was that? Franco said. Just now. The wub, sir, Peterson said. It spoke. They all looked at the wub. What did it say? What did it say? It suggested we talk about other things. Franco walked towards the wub. He went all around it, examining it from every side. Then he came back over and stood with the men. I wonder if there's a native inside it, he said thoughtfully. Maybe we should open it up and have a look. Oh, goodness, the wub cried. Is that all you people can think of? Killing and cutting? Franco clenched his fists. Come out of there, whoever you are, come out! Nothing stirred. The men stood together, their faces blank, staring at the wub. The wub swished its tail. It belched suddenly. I beg your pardon, the wub said. I don't think there's anyone in there, Jones said in a low voice. They all looked at each other. The cook came in. You wanted me, Captain? He said. What's this thing? This is a wub, Franco said. It's to be eaten. Will you measure it and figure out? I think we should have a talk, the wub said. I'd like to discuss this with you, Captain, if I might. I can see that you and I do not agree on some basic issues. The captain took a long time to answer. The bub waited good-naturedly, licking the water from its jowls. Come into my office, the captain said at last. He turned and walked out of the room. The wub rose and padded after him. The men watched it go out. They heard it climbing the stairs. I wonder what the outcome will be, the cook said. Well, I'll be in the kitchen. Let me know as soon as you hear. Sure, Joan said. Sure. The wub eased itself down in the corner with a sigh. You must forgive me, it said. I'm afraid I'm addicted to various forms of relaxation. When one is as large as I... The captain nodded impatiently. He sat down at his desk and folded his hands. All right, he said. Let's get started. You're a wub, is that correct? The wub shrugged. I suppose so. That's what they call us, the natives, I mean. We have our own term. And you speak English. You've been in contact with Earthmen before. No. Then how do you do it? Speak English? Am I speaking English? I'm not conscious of speaking anything in particular. I examined your mind. My mind? I studied the contents, especially the semantic warehouse, as I refer to it. I see, the captain said. Telepathy, of course. We are a very old race, the wub said. Very old and very ponderous. It is difficult for us to move around. You can appreciate that anything so slow and heavy would be at the mercy of more agile forms of life. There was no use in our relying on physical defenses. How could we win? Too heavy to run, too soft to fight, too good-natured to hunt for game. How do you live? Plants, vegetables, we can eat almost anything. We're very Catholic, tolerant, eclectic, Catholic. We live and let live. That's how we've gotten along. The wub eyed the captain. And that's why I so violently objected to this business about having me boiled. I could see the image in your mind. Most of me frozen in the food locker. Some of me in the kettle. A bit for your pet cat. So you read minds, the captain said. How interesting. Anything else? I mean, what else can you do along those lines? A few odds and ends, the wub said absently, staring around the room. A nice apartment you have here, Captain. You keep it quite neat. I respect life forms that are tidy. Some Martian birds are quite tidy. They throw things out of their nests and sweep them. Indeed, the captain nodded. But to get back to the problem... Quite so. You spoke of dining on me. 
The taste, I am told, is good. A little fatty, but tender. But how can any lasting contact be established between your people and mine if you resort to such barbaric attitudes? Eat me? Rather, you should discuss questions with me. Philosophy, the arts. The captain stood up. Philosophy. It might interest you to know that we will be hard put to find something to eat for the next month. An unfortunate spoilage. I know, the wub nodded. But wouldn't it be more in accord with your principles of democracy if we all drew straws or something along that line? After all, democracy is to protect the minority from su just such infringements. Now, if each of us casts one vote, the captain walked to the door. Nuts to you, he said. He opened the door. He opened his mouth. He stood frozen, his mouth wide, his eyes staring, his fingers still on the knob. The wub watched him. Presently it padded out of the room, edging past the captain, and went down the hall, deep in meditation. The room was quiet. So you see, the wub said, we have a common myth. Your mind contains many familiar myth symbols. Ishtar, Odysseus. Peterson sat silently, staring at the floor. He shifted in his chair. Go on, he said. Please go on. I find your Odysseus a figure common to mythology of most self-conscious races. As I interpret it, Odysseus wanders as an individual, aware of himself as such. This is the idea of separation, of separation from family and country, the process of individuation. But Odysseus returns to his home. Peterson looked out the port window, at the stars, endless stars, burning intently in the empty universe. Finally he goes home. As must all creatures, the moment of separation is a temporary period. A brief journey of the soul. It begins. It ends. The wanderer returns to land and race. The door opened. The wub stopped, turning its great head. Captain Franco came into the room. The men behind him. They hesitated at the door. You are right, French said. W do you mean me? Peterson said, surprised. Why me? Franco lowered his gun. Come over here he said to Peterson. Get up and come here. There was silence. Go ahead, the wub said. It doesn't matter. Peterson stood up. What for? It's an order. Peterson walked to the door. French caught his arm. What's going on? Peterson wrenched loose. What's the matter with you? Captain Franco moved towards the wub. The wub looked up from where it lay in the corner, pressed against the wall. It is interesting, the wub said, that you are obsessed with the idea of eating me. I wonder why. Get up, Franco said. If you wish, the wub rose, grunting. Be patient. It is difficult for me. It stood gasping, its tongue lolling foolishly. Shoot it now, French said. For God's sake, Peterson exclaimed. Jones turned to him quickly, his eyes gray with fear. You didn't see him, like a statue, standing there, his mouth open. If we hadn't come down, he'd still be there. Who, the captain? Peterson stared around. But he's all right now. They looked at the wub, standing in the middle of the room, its great chest rising and falling. Come on, Franco said. Out of the way. The men pulled aside toward the door. You are quite afraid, aren't you? The wub said. Have I done anything to you? I am against the idea of hurting. All I have done is try to protect myself. Can you expect me to rush eagerly to my death? I am a sensible being like yourselves. I was curious to see your ship, learn about you. I suggested to the native. The gun jerked. See? Franco said, I thought so. The wub settled down, panting. 
It put its paws out, pulling its tail around it. It is very warm, the wub said. I understand we are close to the jets. Atomic power. You have done many wonderful things with it, technically. Apparently, your scientific hierarchy is not equipped to solve moral, ethical... Franco turned to the men, crowding behind him, wide-eyed, silent. I'll do it. You can watch. French nodded. Try to hit the brains. It's no good for eating. Don't hit it in the chest. If the ribcage shatters, we'll have to pick the bones out. Listen, Peterson said, licking his lips. Has it done anything to you? What harm has it done? I'm asking you. And anyhow, it's still mine. You have no right to shoot it. It doesn't belong to you. Franco raised his gun. I'm going out, Jones said, his face white and sick. I don't want to see it. Me too, French said. The men straggled out, murmuring. Peterson lingered at the door. It was talking to me about Miss, he said. It wouldn't hurt anyone. He went outside. Franco walked toward the wub. The wub looked up slowly. It swallowed. A very foolish thing, it said. I am sorry that you want to do it. There was a parable that your savior related. It stopped staring at the gun. Can you look me in the eye and do it? The wub said. Can you do that? The captain gazed down. I can look you in the eye, he said. Back on the farm we had hogs. Dirty razorback hogs. I can do it. Staring down at the wub, into the gleaming, moist eyes, he pressed the trigger. The taste was excellent. They sat glumly around the table, some of them hardly eating at all. The only one who seemed to be enjoying himself was Captain Franco. More? he said, looking around. More? And some wine, perhaps. Not me, French said. I think I'll go back to the chart room. Me too. Jones stood up, pushing his chair back. I'll see you later. The captain watched them go. Some of the others excused themselves. What do you suppose the matter is? The captain said. He turned to Peterson. Peterson sat staring down at his plate, at the potatoes, the green peas, and at the thick slab of tender, warm meat. He opened his mouth. No sound came. The captain put his hand on Peterson's shoulder. It is only organic matter now, he said. The life essence is gone. He ate, spooning up the gravy with some bread. I, myself, love to eat. It is one of the greatest things that a living creature can enjoy. Eating, resting, meditation, discussing things. Peterson nodded. Two more men got up and went out. The captain drank some water and sighed. Well, he said. I must say that this was a very enjoyable meal. All the reports I had heard were quite true. The taste of wub, very fine. But I was prevented from enjoying this pleasure in times past. He dabbed at his lips with his napkin and leaned back in his chair. Peterson stared dejectedly at the table. The captain watched him intently. He leaned over. Come, come, he said. Cheer up. Let's discuss things. He smiled. As I was saying before I was interrupted, the role of Odysseus in the myths. Peterson jerked up, staring. To go on, the captain said. Odysseus, as I understand him. End of The Wub by Philip K. Dick Recording by Dan McAdam I'll Kill You Tomorrow by Helen Huber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. I'll Kill You Tomorrow by Helen Huber. It was not a sinister silence. No silence is sinister until it acquires a background of understandable menace. Here there was only the night quiet of maternity, 
the silence of noiseless rubber heels on the hospital corridor floor, the faint brush of starched white skirts brushing through doorways into darkened and semi-darkened rooms. But there was something wrong with the silence in the basket room of maternity, the glass-walled room containing row on row the tiny hopes of tomorrow. The curtain was drawn across the window through which, during visiting hours, peered the proud fathers who did the hoping. The night light was dim. The silence should not have been there. Lori Kane, standing in the doorway, looked out over the rows of silent baskets and felt her blonde hair tighten at the roots. The tightening came from instinct, even before her brain had a chance to function, from the instincts and training of a registered nurse. Thirty-odd babies grouped in one room and complete silence. Not a single whimper, not one tiny cry of protest against the annoying phenomenon of birth. Thirty babies? Dead? That was the thought that flashed unbidden into Lorry's pretty head. The absurdity of it followed swiftly, and Lorry moved on rubber soles between a line of baskets. She bent down and explored with practiced fingers. A warm, living bundle in a white basket. The feeling of relief was genuine. Relief, even from an absurdity, is a welcome thing. Lorry smiled and bent closer. Staring up at Lorry from the basket were two clear blue eyes. Two eyes, steady and fixed in a round baby face an immobile pink baby face, housing two blue eyes that stared up into Lorry's with a quiet concentration that was chilling. Lorry said, "'What's the matter with you?' She spoke in a whisper and was addressing herself. She'd gone short on sleep lately, the only way, really, to get a few hours with Pete. Pete was an intern at General Hospital and the kind of a homely grinning carrot-top a girl like Lorry could put into dreams as the center of a satisfactory future. But all this didn't justify a case of jitters in the basket-room. Lorry said, "'Hi, short stuff,' and lifted Baby Newcomb, male, out of his crib for a cuddling. Baby Newcomb didn't object. The blue eyes came closer, the weak old eyes with the hundred-year-old look. Lorry laid the bundle over her shoulder and smiled into the dimness. "'You want to be president, Shorty?' Lorry felt the warmth of a new life, felt the little body wriggle in snug contentment. "'I wouldn't advise it. Tough job.' Baby Newcomb twisted in his blanket. Lorry stiffened. "'Snug contentment?' Lorry felt two tiny hands clutch and dig into her throat not just pawing baby hands, little fingers that reached and explored for the windpipe. She uncuddled the soft bundle, held it out. There were the eyes. She chilled. No imagination here. No specter from lack of sleep. Ancient murder-hatred glowing in newborn eyes. "'Careful, you fool! You'll drop this body!' A thin piping voice a shrill symphony in malevolence. Fear weakened Lori. She found a chair and sat down. She held the boy baby in her hands. Training would not allow her to drop baby Newcomb. Even if she had fainted, she would not have let go. The shrill voice, "'It was stupid of me, very stupid!' Lori was cold, sick, mute. "'Very stupid!' These hands are too fragile. There are no muscles in the arms. I couldn't have killed you. Please, I... Dreaming? No. I'm surprised at... Well, at your surprise. You have a trained mind. You should have learned long ago to trust your senses. I don't understand. Don't look at the doorway. Nobody's coming in. Look at me. Give me a little attention, and I'll explain." Explain? Lori pulled her eyes down to the cherubic little face as she parroted dully. I'll begin by reminding you that there are more things in existence than your obscene medical books tell you about. Who are you? 
What are you? One of those things? You're not a baby. Of course I'm not. I'm... The beastly, brittle voice drifted into silence as though halted by an intruding thought. Then the thought voiced, voiced with a yearning at once pathetic and terrible. It would be nice to kill you. Some day I will. Some day I'll kill you if I can find you. Why? Why? Insane words in an insane world. But life had not stopped even though madness had taken over. Why? The voice was matter-of-fact again. No more time for pleasant daydreams. I'm something your books didn't tell you about. Naturally, you're bewildered. Did you ever hear of a bodiless entity? Lorry shuddered in silence. You've heard of bodiless entities, of course, but you denied their existence in your smug world of precise, tidy detail. I'm a bodiless entity. I'm one of a swarm. We come from a dimension your mind wouldn't accept even if I explained it, so I'll save words. We of the swarm seek unfoldment, fulfillment, even as you in your stupid, blind world. Do you want to hear more? I... You're a fool, but I enjoy practicing with these new vocal cords just as I enjoyed flexing the fingers and muscles. That's why I revealed myself. We are basically, of course, parasites. In the dimension where we exist in profusion, evolution has provided for us. There we seek out and move into a dimensional entity far more intelligent than yourself. We destroy it in a way you wouldn't understand, and it is not important that you should. In fact, I can't see what importance there is in your existing at all. You plan to kill all these babies? Let me congratulate you. You finally managed to voice an intelligent question. The answer is no. We aren't strong enough to kill them. We dwelt in a far more delicate dimension than this one, and all was in proportion. That was our difficulty when we came here. We could find no entities weak enough to take possession of until we came upon this room full of infants. Then, if you're helpless, what do we plan to do? That's quite simple. These material entities will grow. We will remain attached, ingrained, so to speak. When the bodies enlarge sufficiently... Thirty potential assassins! Lori spoke again to herself, then hurled the words back into her own mind as her sickness deepened. The shrill chirping. What do you mean, potential? The word expresses a doubt. Here there is none." The entity's chuckle sounded like a baby, content over a full bottle. Thirty certain assassins! But why must you kill? Lori was sure the tiny shoulders shrugged. Why? I don't know. I never thought to wonder. Why must you join with a man and propagate some day? Why do you feel sorry for what you term an unfortunate? Explain your instincts, and I'll explain mine." Lori felt herself rising. Stiffly she put baby Newcomb back into his basket. As she did so, a ripple of shrill, jerky laughter crackled through the room. Lori put her hands to her ears. "'You know I can't say anything. You keep quiet. They call me mad.' "'Precisely.' Malicious laughter, like driven sleet cut into her ears as she fled from the room. Peter Larchmont, M.D., was smoking a quick cigarette by an open fire-escape door on the third floor. He turned as Lorry came down the corridor, flipped his cigarette down into the alley, and grinned. "'Women shouldn't float on rubber heels,' he said. "'A man should have warning.' Lorry came close. "'Kiss me! Kiss me! Hard!' Pete kissed her, then held her away. "'You're trembling. Anticipation, pet?' He looked into her face, and the grin faded. "'Lori, what is it?' "'Pete, Pete, 
I'm crazy. I've gone mad. Hold me." He could have laughed, but he had looked closely into her eyes, and he was a doctor. He didn't laugh. Tell me. Just stand here. I'll hang on to you, and you tell me. The babies. They've gone mad. She clung to him. Not exactly that. Something's taken them over. Something terrible. Oh, Pete, nobody would believe me. I believe the end result, he said quietly. That's what I'm for, Angel. When you shake like this, I'll always believe. But I'll have to know more, and I'll hunt for an answer. There isn't any answer, Pete. I know. We'll still look. Tell me more first. There isn't any more. Her eyes widened as she stared into his with the shock of a new thought. Oh, Lord! One of them talked to me, but maybe he, or it, won't talk to you. Then you'll never know for sure. You'll think I'm— Stop it. Quit predicting what I'll do. Let's go to the nursery. They went to the nursery and stayed there for three quarters of an hour. They left with the tinny laughter filling their minds and the last words of the monstrous entity. "'We'll say no more, of course. Perhaps even this incident has been indiscreet. But it's in the form of a celebration. Never before has a whole swarm gotten through. Only a single entity on rare occasions.' Pete leaned against the corridor wall and wiped his face with the sleeve of his jacket. "'We're the only ones who know,' he said or ever will know." Lori pushed back a lock of his curly hair. She wanted to kiss him, but this didn't seem to be the place or the time. "'We can never tell anyone. We'd look foolish. We've got a horror on our hands and we can't pass it on. What are we going to do?' Lori asked. "'I don't know. Let's recap a little. Got a cigarette?' They went to the fire door and dragged long and deep on two from Lorry's pack. They'll be quiet from now on. No more talking, just baby squalls. And thirty little assassins will go into thirty homes, Lorry said, all dressed in soft pink and blue, all filled with hatred, waiting, biding their time, growing more clever. She shuddered. The electric chair will get them all eventually. But how many will they get in the meantime? Pete put his arms around her and drew her close and whispered into her ear. There's nothing we can do. Nothing. We've got to do something. Lori heard again the thin, brittle laughter following her, taunting her. It was a bad dream. It didn't happen. We'll just have to sleep it off. She put her cheek against his. The rising stubble of his beard scratched her face. She was grateful for the rough touch of solid reality. Pete said, The shock will wear out of our minds. Time will pass. After a while, we won't believe it ourselves. That's what I'm afraid of. It's got to be that way. We've got to do something. Pete lowered his arms wearily. Yeah we've got to do something. Where there's nothing that can be done. What are we, miracle workers? We've got to do something. Sure, finish out the watch and then get some sleep. Lori awoke with the lowering sun in her window. It was a blood-red sun. She picked up the phone by her bedside. Room 307, residence extension. Pete answered drowsily. Lori said, Tell me, did I dream, or did it really happen? I was going to ask you the same thing. I guess it happened. What are you doing? Lying in bed. So am I. But two different beds. Things are done all wrong. Want to take a chance and sneak over? I've got an illegal coffee pot. Leave the door unlocked. Lori put on the coffee. She showered and got into her slip. She was brushing her hair when Pete came in. He looked at her and extended, beckoning, clutching fingers. The hell with phantoms, 
Come here. After a couple of minutes, Lori pulled away and poured the coffee. She reached for her uniform. Pete said, Don't put it on yet. Too dangerous, leaving it off. He eyed her dreamily. I'll dredge up willpower. I'll also get scads of fat rich clients. Then we'll get married so I can assault you legally." Lorry studied him. "'You're not even listening to yourself. What is it, Pete? What have you dreamed up?' "'Okay. I've got an idea. You said something would have to be done. What? A drastic cure for a drastic case, with maybe disaster as the end product. Tell me. I'll tell you a little, but not too much. Why not all? Because, if we ever land in court, I want to be able to say under oath, he didn't tell me what he planned to do. I don't like that. I don't care if you like it or not. Tell me, what's the one basic thing that stands out in your mind about these entities? That they're... Fragile? Yes, fragile. Give me some more coffee. Lori demanded to know what was in Pete's mind. All she got was kissed, and she did not see Pete again until eleven o'clock that night. He found her in the corridor in maternity and motioned her toward the nursery. He carried a tray under a white towel. He said, You watch the door. I'm going inside. I'll be about a half an hour. What are you going to do? You stay out here and mind your business. Your business will be to steer any nosy party away. If you can't, make noise coming in." Doc Pete turned away and entered the nursery. Lori stood at the doorway, in the silence, under the brooding nightlight, and prayed. Twenty-five minutes later Pete came out. His face was white and drawn. He looked like a man who had lately had a preview of Hell's inverted pleasures. His hands trembled. The towel still covered the tray. He said, Watch them close. Don't move ten steps from here. He started away, turned back. All hell is scheduled to break loose in this hospital shortly. Let's hope God remains in charge. Larry saw the sick dread of his heart underneath his words. It could have been a major scandal. An epidemic of measles on the maternity floor of a modern hospital indicates the unforgivable medical sin, carelessness. It was hushed up as much as possible, pending the time when the top people could shake off the shock and recover their wits. The ultimate recovery of thirty babies was a tribute to everyone concerned. Juan, done in, Doc Pete drank coffee in Lori's room. Lori gave him three lumps of sugar and said, But are you sure the sickness killed the entities? Quite sure. Somehow they knew when I made the injections. They screamed. They knew they were done for. It took courage. Tell me, why are you so strong, so brave? Why are you so wonderful? Cut it out. I was scared stiff. If one baby had died, I'd have gone through life weighing the cure against the end. It isn't easy to risk doing murder, however urgent the need. She leaned across and kissed him. And you were all alone. You wouldn't let me help. Was that fair?" He grinned, then sobered. But I can't help remembering what that... that invisible monster said. Never before has a whole swarm gotten through, only a single entity on rare occasions. I can't help wondering what happens to those single entities. I think of the newspaper headlines I've seen. Child kills parents in sleep. Youth slays father. I'll probably always wonder, and I'll always remember." Lori got up and crossed to him and put her arms around him. "'Not always,' she whispered. "'There will be times when I'll make you forget. For a little while, anyhow.'" The End of I'll Kill You Tomorrow by Helen Huber